Very good. The mixed emotions of motherhood. And you know, it's funny, where does a message come from? And after you doing your 18th, like, well, I've probably done more than that, Mother's Day, 18 Mother's Day sermons here, it's like, after a while, it's like, what do you talk about for Mother's Day, you know? But um, we have a, a family group chat, and um, we just kind of share stuff as a family and siblings, and my mom and dad are on it, and we share all kinds of stuff. And the other day, uh, Lisa was sharing something about her mixed emotions as Ashley gets prepared to graduate here this year, and, um, and just the mixed emotions of how that feels seeing her getting ready to graduate. And I know what that's like when Melissa graduated as well. And you, you think there's no more, you know, no more choir or band concerts to go to. And you're really no more sporting events for some people, whatever they're in, whatever they're involved in. No more parent-teacher conferences. We all love those, right? But there are those mixed emotions of... Motherhood, and I was thinking, you know, in doing this, we're in this series on detoxifying, it's like I thought, well, I could do a series, I could do a sermon on, you know, toxic parenting, that would be uplifting, wouldn't it? Uh, But uh, we're not going to do that today, although there are some things in here that might actually aim a little in that direction, but we want to talk today about the mixed emotions of motherhood. Now, we ran across an article by Nancy Ortberg. Let me just share this article. She kind of speaks to this reality. She called it the Jekyll and Hyde nature of motherhood. When I became a mother, I found a Jekyll inside of me. For the first time, there was a person in my life whom I loved more than I loved myself. I was doing unselfish things because I wanted to. I was becoming a patient and kind, calm, reasonable, generous, thoughtful, loving person. I thought, this is good. This is a good thing. This person who is emerging, I loved being a mom. But then there is another person who comes out sometimes when I am a mom, a person I don't know, and I want to say, who is she? How can I make her go away? At one time, I had a three-year-old, a two-year-old, and an infant. I woke to the fussy baby. He clung to me like a baby monkey hangs on to its mother and would not let me put him down. While Johnny was clinging to me, my toddler was unwinding the toilet paper and making designs in every room of the house. She also took all of the books off of the shelves and started tearing pages out of them. While this was going on, my three-year-old was begging me to play Candyland. I hate Candyland. There was a mound of dirty laundry threatening to suffocate me. There was no food in the house, and I had to go to the grocery store. At the grocery store, I had a baby clinging to me, a toddler in the grocery cart, and my other one running up and down the aisles. And the grocery cart was so full, I had to kick the pad of diapers down the aisle. In the toilet paper section, I fought to hold back the tears as I thought, what am I doing with my life? Look at me. Back at home, I unloaded the groceries, fixing lunch while the ice cream melted. Then I took the kids to the park before rest time. A park with three children is not fun. I kept counting. One, two, three. I came with three. I've got to leave with three. (laughs) By the time I got home, I hated myself. I hated my children. I put them in their rooms and shut the doors. Of course, none of them slept. And I went into the garage and I cried. I just thought I was going to lose my mind. I felt like I was becoming an impatient, frazzled, rude, angry, frustrated mom. And I was spitting and splitting into two people. Not all moms are like that. I know moms who are patient and kind toward their children almost all of the time. I admire them. I don't like them, but I admire them. (laughs) That is not me, Nancy Ortberg. And that's not all theologically sound, as we'll see in the message today a little bit, but her feelings are very relatable to a lot of moms. And we want to talk, as Nancy goes on to talk about, the love and grace of Christ that meets us sometimes in those moments when we feel so overwhelmed that we don't like who we see in them, when we're not the best version of ourselves. God's love and grace rises up. And there's this question I thought, what a great question to start with. And it's simply this, you know, how do I find joy in my frustration? How do I find joy in the midst of all this frustration? And how does a mom do that? This morning, we're going to be talking to the moms and, and women. And, but, but the reality is everything we talk about is transferable in ways to all of our lives. We can think about some of these things, how they relate to us. And how do we find that deeper joy in the midst of our frustrations? We know in the book of Hebrews that Jesus, as he went to the cross, and the cross had to be a frustrating thing, right? What about the mixed emotions of the cross? Like, Lord, if there's any other way, but Lord, I'll go do it. You know, it's like, I love them, but I hate them. It's like the mixed emotions of the cross that even Jesus dealt with in his human emotions and he goes to the cross and the Bible tells us in Hebrews that for the joy that awaited him on the other side he went to 
the cross. And here's the key we can learn from Jesus, and we, we've talked about this a lot lately. Don't base your faith on your feelings. Don't base your faith on your feelings, right? Because some days you're not going to feel it, and some days you're not going to like the assessment of who you are in the mirror. So don't base your faith on your feelings. A couple of encouraging verses here. Proverbs 23, 25. Let your father and mother be glad. Let her who bore you rejoice. So moms, there is joy in motherhood. You know that, right? Here's a great verse. One time Jesus was talking to the disciples about how he was going to go to the cross and die and be put in a grave. And he tried to explain to them what that would be like for them. And here's his illustration. If then you have been raised with Christ. Sorry, that's a, that's a wrong first line. That's copy and paste error there. So second line. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. So this, this woman is in great sorrow and anguish because she's delivering and then the baby's born and it's like all that anguish goes away. And he says, so also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again and your hearts will rejoice and no one will take your joy from you. What a great illustration. He would go into the grave and they would be in sorrow for three days. But when he came out of that grave and they realized the resurrection happened, the joy that would flood their life. And so he's just saying that for moms, that's kind of a similar illustration of what they go through when it comes to birth. There's this incredible joy that can come from being a mom and yet sometimes it's a mixed bag. It's in the mixed emotions. It's the frustrations that go along with being a mom and the, and the role of motherhood. There's a simple lesson though and if you want to know the deeper joy in life, here's a simple lesson. It is, is underscored throughout the Bible. In the life of Jesus himself and in the very character of the Father we see this simple lesson it's going to shape today's message. It's our big idea. We will, uh, we will experience a deeper joy as we bring joy to others. We will experience a deeper joy as we bring joy to others. And mom, there's joy in motherhood. And you know where you'll find your deepest joy as you simply bring joy to the rest of those in your family. It's true for all of us, but it'll be true for moms. And how can we find joy in our frustration? Well, focus on bringing joy to others. Acts 20, 35. In all these things... Uh, I have shown you, says Paul, that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, right? How he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. There's something about giving and sacrificing and serving and bringing joy to others that brings joy back into our own life. Now today, as we get into our key text for today, remember we're in this series of detoxifying. And so today, as we go through this, we're going to see a few toxic lies interwoven that moms are fed and that we just need to make them aware of and that we need to understand this simple lesson here, right? That God's pure truth will chelate the enemy's toxic lies. You want to get those toxic lies out of your life, the pure truth of God's word. And today, we're going to look at seven verses in 1 Peter 3. And these, the truth in these verses can just drive the toxic lies and can help us experience more of the joy of Christ. Can help us really express more of the personhood of Christ in our life. Today's text will be really this, the beauty of a godly woman. We're going to look at today these verses that says how beautiful you are inside as a woman. An incredibly beautiful, uh, godly woman. And sometimes we don't feel that way. We don't always, maybe you don't always feel that way inside and you look in the mirror, you, you, your, your actions don't feel so awesome and so beautiful, but you are. If you know Christ, you are a, a beautiful and godly woman inside. And that's today's text. The context of this is the Jews that were in Pentecost had been persecuted. And so all these thousands of people are coming to Christ. They're Jewish. They're coming to Christ at Pentecost. They're being persecuted by the likes of the Apostle Paul. Before he's Paul, he's Saul. And they're being persecuted and they're, they're spreading out in all of the various regions. And so Peter writes to them in the book of First Peter, the more specific uh, text for us today is this wife living with an unbelieving husband. Talk about a frustrating situation. So here's a woman, and I don't know how we arrive at this point, but there's this woman, there's these women, they love Christ, they love Jesus, they're believers, they're married to those who don't. Maybe they're, I don't know. I don't know if these are, are those that may, maybe they were just Jews, but didn't believe in Jesus. I don't know what the context here is, but there are those that are unbelieving husbands and these wives 
and they're living in this situation. This is the text this morning. And how does this woman in this frustrating situation, how does she find joy? And we're going to apply that even through, through uh, all of our lives to mothers. We're not going to talk as much about that aspect as... And then the application today is just simply mom's impact on her family. And mom, you can have a grave impact on your family, an incredible impact on your family. And uh, the things we look at today will help us understand that simple reality. Here's our key passage. Let's read through the first four verses. Likewise, wives, here's what Peter writes to these wives. Be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. When they see your respectful and pure conduct, do not let your adorning be the external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. And here's today's big idea again. We will experience a deeper joy as we bring joy to others. We will do that. We'll see that in this text. We'll see that throughout the message. And we want to look today. There's three words we're going to focus on today. The word adorn, the word conduct, and the word submit. Those three words. And they all kind of weave themselves together in this narrative here. Three steps to finding joy in your frustration. And just think of walking in the Spirit, right? Just think that if you're, as you're we're told to walk in the Spirit, He will lead us to take these three steps. Adorn yourself conduct yourself and submit yourself and we'll see exactly what those means and how they help us find joy and we will start here the first thing is adorn yourself authentically adorn yourself moms authentically and again we're writing to christian moms this is the advantage if you know christ you got an incredible advantage because you may not always feel beautiful you may not always look beautiful you you may hate yourself some days but the reality is inside you are a beautiful, godly woman with a gentle, quiet spirit. There's a hidden person inside of you and you need to let that person out. Adorn yourself authentically. Let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit. Love that word imperishable. Some translations say incorruptible. Some say unfading. You have a, your character, your identity in Christ. It can't be taken away. It's indestructible. That's who you are until the day you leave this earth and you have a gentle and quiet spirit how amazing is that how amazing is that now there's a toxic lie that seeps in here right and it's this toxic lie that women hear that i will never be good enough or i will never measure up i'm never going to be good enough i'm never going to measure up and and uh, maybe nancy ortberg felt that way that day and she looked at her kids and she looked at her life and she just thought, I, some moms can do it, I can't, I'll never measure up. You ever felt that way? And I thought about the impossible standards that are set before us. There's two impossible standards. Let me talk about those just briefly here. The first one is this, is that through Christ I measure up to God's spiritual standards. See, this woman has this hidden beautiful person of the heart. She has this gentle, quiet spirit. Why? Because Christ gave it to her. Because she's defined by Christ and not by how her kids behave or how she responds to their behavior or how she feels. And so through Christ, I measure up to God's spiritual standard. See here, Peter is not saying it's wrong to dress up, to wear fancy jewelry, to do your hair, to wear some beautiful perfume. All that's fine. What he's saying is let your inner beauty define you before everyone. Let them see your inner beauty before they see your outer beauty because you are truly beautiful inside because of what Christ has done for you. Um, there is a verse here. I didn't put it on the screen. Colossians 3, 9 through 14. Seeing that you have put, on, put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, Christ is all and in all. We looked at that last week, that verse, right? That Christ is all and in all. That Christ is in every one of us who know uh, him as our Savior. Christ is our identity. He is in all. And he is all. Christ is now our very life. How amazing, how amazing, how amazing is that? Here's the other side of that. You don't have to measure up to the world's superficial standard. 
You don't have to measure up to the world's superficial standard. And there's the superficial standard the world sets out there, right? And so what do we do? I mean, what do most moms do? And a lot of us do, but you get into this trap of trying to compare yourself. Like that Nancy Ortberg is like comparing herself to these other moms. I don't like them because they seem to have a handle on things. And, and you don't have to measure up to this world because you measure up to Christ. Christ is all and is in all. And Christ is the standard. See, see, what, see what happens when you know Christ is your life? Like if you come to, to church and everyone in here knows Christ and Christ is the standard and Christ is your life and, and it takes, all the, takes all the ability to try to fight to compare yourselves and measure up to each, you don't have to. I measure up to Christ. I mean, you can't get any higher than that, can you? How amazing is that? But we do live in this reality where the world today, have you ever seen, I'm sure you've heard of this, right? The, the airbrushed magazine covers, right? Like, you got this celebrity on this cover and someone leaks the before and after pictures and, you know, on that, you know, they've air, airbrushed out about 10 pounds and, and all the wrinkles and pimples on the face and they've sculpted the body just beautiful and the cheekbones are great. And, wow. Well, who can, who can live up to that? No one can. It's not real. It's superficial. And that happens all the time. There's a superficial standard. That is out there. I found this. I thought this was fascinating. Young women are obsessed with digital beautifiers. Listen to this. Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram, and other social media sites have recently begun offering high-tech filters. With a few simple clicks, these filters will beautify the appearance of teenage girls and young women in their social media profiles. The filters have exploded in popularity as millions of users now get model-esque looks by sharpening, shrinking, enhancing, and recoloring their faces and bodies. Researchers have named it Augmented Reality, AR, and are concerned that these girls are subjects in an experiment that will show how the technology changes the way we form our identities, represent ourselves, and relate to others. And it's all happening without much oversight. Both Facebook and Instagram claim that over 600 million people have used the beautifiers. Facebook reports that about 10,000 employees are working on AR and virtual reality products. More than 400,000 third-party creators have produced a total of over 1.2 million effects on Facebook alone. Girls say an Instagram face is a small nose, big eyes, clear skin, and big lips. Researchers are concerned that many young girls express an interest in real-life plastic surgery to obtain a look similar to their online image. Christy Crotty, Krista Crotty, a specialist on eating disorders and mental health, sees that a sense of anxiety develops when girls live with the incongruity of their online and in-person selves. Preteens are also being affected. Claire Prescott, a researcher on preteens and social media, reports that young girls say things like, I put this filter on because I have flawless skin. It takes away my scars and spots. She is concerned that for young people trying to figure out who they are, it can be harmful. I don't think it's just filtering your actual image. It's filtering your whole life. An article from, from 2021 that's just the reality. There's a superficial standard in the world. You don't got to meet it. If you meet the standard in Christ, you can't meet a higher standard. You are a beautiful, godly woman with a gentle, quiet spirit. Adorn yourself authentically. Let the world see the true you. There's another toxic lie that kind of seeps in here, though. I want you to see this and understand why this kind of, how this fits in. You ever heard this lie? I am enough. You can find all kinds of women bloggers all over the internet say, you are enough. Believe in yourself. Sad thing is you, you can find Christian bloggers say, you are enough. You believe, believe you are enough. And, and they're, they're semi-supposedly Christian authors, these women that write these books, you know, that kind of preach that same thing. I think there's a book, something like Women Wash Your Face. I don't know what it is. There's something like that. And they kind of teach this kind of stuff. And the reality is there's a little bit of a theological truth in this and that in Christ I am. But this, this phrase is not implying that. This phrase is implying that I, I'm enough on my own. Let me just tell you, Adam and Eve in the garden were created perfect and holy in God's image. They still needed to walk in the garden every day with Christ. They were not enough on their own. He has wired us, designed us to feed off of Him, for Him to be the source. But look at this. Look at these two lies. There's this lie. I will never be good enough or measure up, right? And then there's this lie. I am enough. You see what the enemy does there? 
You figured out what the enemy does there when he lies to us? Like he lies over here, you're not good enough. Over here, oh, you're awesome. You're wonderful. You're enough. He'll throw any lie at you. That will, he doesn't care what the lie is as long as it works, as long as it drives you away from Christ and has you trusting yourself. And it's just so amazing to stop and think about how both those lies contradict each other. Both of those lies, the enemy speaks to us. So that's the first one. Adorn yourself authentically. And just know we will experience a deeper joy as we bring joy to others. And so just know, let me just tell you something. How many people don't think that the world would agree that if everybody in the world lived more like Jesus, the world would be a better place, right? A lot of people don't think Jesus, there's a lot of people today don't, don't think Jesus is God or Savior or He rose from the grave. But He was a great guy, and if we all live more like Jesus, the world would be a better place. Well, they are right. And let me, let me just tell you you, you, you have the Spirit of Christ in you. If you let people see the Spirit of Christ, if you adorn yourself with the Spirit of Christ, you'll bring joy to your family. You will bring joy to your family. Second, conduct yourself respectfully. Conduct yourself respectfully. He says, so that they they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. Hmm. And we kind of get into the inner man versus the outer man here. Like the inner man, we just talked about the inner man, who you are on the inside, the hidden person of your heart, your gentle, quiet spirit. That's who you are in Christ. And here's the outer man. And it's kind of like this juxtaposition that we always see in Scripture. It's kind of like the inner man is who I am. That will never change. This is how I'm defined before God's eyes, who I am. The outer man is how I behave. Sometimes I don't always behave like I should. I don't always like my behavior. Always remember who you are. And here's the reality. Your outer conduct needs to reflect your inner spirit. That's the beauty of it. Adorn yourself and and, and may the person you are on the inside shine through your conduct. May that unbelieving husband see the authentic you in Christ. Now understand why this can be challenging. Think about in this just in this passage here. There's this woman. She she loves Jesus, she loves Christ. She's a believer. She's married to an unbeliever over here. That'd be very frustrating. Very frustrating, very challenging. And the question is how does she find joy in that frustration? Well, she brings joy to her husband and joy to her family. You ever heard this toxic lie before? I just don't have it in me. Like, I know I need to forgive that person or I know I need to love that person or I need to let go of this hurt or this baggage or this whatever. I just don't have it in me. I'm just exhausted. I can't do it. You ever heard that lie? Enemy will whisper that in your ears. That's probably why Nancy Ortberg ended up in the garage crying while her kids were running around the bedroom not sleeping. She had just like, I can't do this. The Apostle Paul has some amazing insight into this for us because Paul dealt with this himself. And here's what Paul said in his own ministry. He said this to the Corinthians, For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death, but that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. Maybe you've heard that lie, you know, God never gives you more than you can handle. That's another toxic lie. No, He does. God will give you more than you can handle. It's right there. We had more than we could handle. Why? So we would realize Christ is my life. Christ is my source. Christ is my strength. That I would fall back on Christ. And He is the one, right, who raises the dead. Just like in that earlier passage in John, like, right? Like, like, I'm the one you're going to be sorrowful for. I'm going to go into the grave. You're going to be sad for a few days, but I'm going to come out. And you're going to be very happy because I am the God who raises the dead and I can help you find joy in your frustration. Hmm. Being a mom can be a real joy and other times it can be very frustrating. We can feel like we have come to the end of our rope. We have more than we can handle, but you have the God of resurrection on your side. And uh, we have a God who who, who countered the disciples' temporary sorrow in the same way. Hmm. Now here's the point, the deeper point. It's not just being able to handle what life throws at us through Christ. It's not just that. It goes even deeper. 
Peter wants us to understand that our conduct can actually bring joy to other people. Like when I'm in that frustrating situation, it's not that I just find joy for me, it's that I find joy for you. I find joy for the people who maybe are my enemies. I find joy for the people all around me by the way I live my life. Let's transfer this a minute. We think about this idea of conduct, right? And, and so here in this passage, the woman is supposed to give conduct to this unbelieving husband that would help him come to Christ. In fact, it is such an amazing thing when you think about what he says here, what Peter says here. Peter says, if I can find that verse again, he says, um, that they may be one without a word, but by the conduct of their wives. Isn't that amazing? Like, You've got this unbelieving spouse, and you, you, know, you know what? You're not going to win him by arguing with him or debating with him or convincing him or showing him all the theology. You know how you might win him? By your conduct, by just the way you live your life. And so I want to transfer that a little bit to, to moms today as, as you live as moms today. Think about this. Let your conduct bring your children joy. How about we just look at this, this angle for a minute? What are some ways? I've got eight real simple ways. I'm going to throw them out real quickly here. Oh, you, can, you can help your children find joy in life, like follow through, which means to be consistent. Follow through. That means if you say you're going to discipline them, you know what? You discipline them. And you know, kids might not want to be disciplined, but you know what they, they, would, they would like more than, than um, not being disciplined is, is a mom that's consistent and follows through and teaches them right and wrong and, and does discipline them when, they, when she says they will. There is something about being consistent in that sense if we say something's valuable if we say we we value something in life back it up not with your words with your conduct say this isn't why this is important we believe this is important this is valuable show it to them if you make a promise keep your promise and i understand that sometimes we sometimes it's impossible to keep your word sometimes you make promises and life happens i get it but your kids are going to know if if you just make promises nonchalantly and don't keep them, or if, if life happens on occasion and they'll give you grace. Follow through, which means to be consistent. Titus was, was telling, uh, uh, Peter, Peter, Paul was telling Titus here how the young women should behave themselves. Think, think of the young moms. Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works. And in your teaching, show integrity, dignity, and sound speech that cannot be condemned, so that an opponent may be put to shame having nothing evil to say about you. Hmm. Nothing to say about you. Model that behavior. Here's a second way is be fair. Like, just be fair. And, and you don't show favoritism. And I get it. Most moms don't have a favorite child. Okay, Moms have a favorite child. The one that's not misbehaving at the moment is usually the favorite child, you know. But seriously, don't show favoritism. And where this comes into play many times and what we struggle with as moms and sometimes even as dads, you struggle with this when you relate to one child more than another. If you've got three daughters and one loves to shop and one loves computers and one loves artwork and you love shopping, well, hey, you know, you could relate to her more and it could look like you're showing favoritism to her. So go out of your way to connect with that person on the computer or to connect through artwork. Just, just be fair and don't show favoritism and you will bring, bring greater joy to your kids. You'll bring greater joy to your kids. How about this one? Train up a child and the way she go. Uh, raise them right. Just raise them right. Don't show favoritism and then raise them right. And, and we, we look at this verse so many times. In fact, here it is right here. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. This again, we said this so many times. This is not a promise that if you raise your kids, they'll never leave the faith and, and it'll all go... Per this is saying, this is a principle that if you train up a child in the way he should go, what's their personality? What are their skills? What, what are their abilities? You know the four personality traits, right? I'm an otter, like I'm, you know, I like to be the life of the party and tell jokes. My sister's, I think, is a beaver. She, she's very, you know, detailed and organized, I think. But we're all different. Cindy might be an otter, I think. We have, my brother's a lion. He's, you know, he runs his own business, makes all the money. You know, we're all, we're all unique. We're all different. And so know what your child is and raise them in that way. And they'll be more likely 
to stick to the faith, to follow Christ, but it's not a guarantee. You need to know that's not a guarantee and some kids wander from the faith. But you can impact their life if you raise them right, raise them according to how God has wired them. They're unique. And then don't project, don't expect your kids to fulfill your unmet dreams. Just because you didn't have confidence back in the day, just because you weren't, you know, um, you know, determined back in the day, whatever it is. And sometimes we grow up and we're, we're a little sad that we didn't follow through on some dream. And then we kind of project it onto our kids and we want them to fulfill our dream. And we need to realize They may have their own dreams. They're wired as their own person. Help them discover who Christ has made them and called them to be. And then show grace. Forgive and apologize when necessary. I mean, yeah, let's be rich in grace. Even if you have to punish, let's be rich in grace. Let's let's show our kids, teach our kids what it's like to be forgiving, to not hold uh, things against them. There's a fine line there between punishing your kids and showing them grace sometimes. And just know this, it's never a sign of weakness when you apologize to your kids, right? We, we all get it wrong. We can come and say, you know what, I'm sorry. I got angry earlier, I shouldn't have gotten angry, or I didn't understand all the facts earlier, I'm sorry. You know, I, I, I was over the top in my punishment, I was just mad. And sometimes we are wrong, and it's never a sign of weakness to come and apologize to your kids. You know what you're doing? You're teaching them to grow up and learn how to apologize. And then pray often for your kids. Just pray often. Pray for their protection and their confidence and more than anything, pray for their salvation. Pray that they would come to that point of trusting Christ as their Savior. Pray for that day when they will make faith their own. Like, like you know, there's a point when you grow up and you, you have to go to church not because your dad drags you to church or you read your Bible not because you're Mom tells you to read your Bible, but you go to church because you want to go to church and you want to read your Bible and you want this faith thing to be your own. There's there's a point when you have to assume that. And so pray. Just like the prodigal dad. I'm sure the prodigal dad, when his son was off there in that country for how many months or years, however long it was, I'm sure he was praying every day. Maybe you need to pray for your adult kids that have wandered away from the faith. Pray for them every day. Pray for them to find their way back, to find their hope in Christ again. And then trust God. Trust God. Entrust children to your God. Entrust your children to God and train your children to trust God. There's two sides to this. It's like, can you entrust your kids to God? Can you, can you say, Lord, I believe that you love my kids more than I do, that you know them better than I do, that you got a better plan for their life than I do, and I can trust you with them, right? That's tough sometimes. I remember doing youth ministry years ago, and I was just focused on youth ministry, and, and I, a lot of parents loved it when, you know, the kids came and got involved and, and, and didn't get into drugs and didn't get into alcohol and, and didn't get arrested and didn't get into trouble, and, you know, all that stuff was great. But then when the kids got really serious about following the Lord and, and making a real commitment to Him with their life, then the parents were like, oh, wait a minute, you're getting a little radical here now. You know, wait, time out. Can we trust our kids to God? And I think that the answer to that is yes, 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 but then sometimes we hold our kids really tightly. It's like, no, you're not allowed to go over to Zambia and be a missionary. You're not allowed to do that. And maybe that's what God wants for them. And the reality is, do we believe that God can help our kids thrive and find more joy in this world than we can? So trust your kids to God, and as you trust your kids to God, you know what you're going to do? You're going to teach them to trust God. Someday you're not going to be around. Someday they're going to be on their own. And when you're not around, they need to be able to trust in God themselves. And this is the thing, I mean, my mom does such a great job of teaching me, and teaching our family to, to just trust God. I mean, I did things, I remember the first time I was 20 and I rented the roller rink and paid the money and showed a movie and had all these kids come in. I was pretty young back then and I didn't have the money to do that you know back then 1600 bucks that was a lot of money back in that day and uh why did I do something so crazy that's just the kind of things that my mom taught us to do and the kind of faith she instilled up in uh, upon us and uh yes my mom she taught us that and if God had called me off to the mission field she would have yeah she would have been heartbroken but she would have said you got to go you got to go because God's calling you. That's what my mom would have done. 
And then teach wisdom. Teach your children how to apply knowledge, right? Teach your children how to apply the knowledge of God. I didn't put the the verse on the screen. Colossians 3.16 Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. In other words, don't just teach them what to think, but teach them how to think. Give your kids some wisdom. Here are, the, here are mom's ten commandments or words of wisdom. Number one, sick people belong in bed. Thank you notes, thank you notes, thank you notes. Everyone needs a nap every day. Get your hair off your face. Stand up straight. Look people in the eye when you meet them. Good table manners are important in case you get invited to a rich person's house for dinner. If you get a pet, I'll end up taking care of it. You can't go outside in that. Whatever you're doing, stop it. So, mom's 10 commandments of wisdom. But teach your kids wisdom. Teach them how to navigate this world. And finally, let go. Teach your kids how to let go. Teach your kids how to detoxify. Teach them how to detoxify. How to, how to weed out bad relationships in their life. How to let go of hurts. How to let go of bitterness. How to let go of anger. How to Teach them because you mirror that for them. You don't hold grudges. You don't, you don't aren't angry. You're not a bitter person. And they watch you get deeply hurt and they watch you let that go. I watched my mom and dad do that. I mean, they were wrong. They were hurt. They, they went through a lot. And you know what? They showed us to let that stuff go and not let it rule your life. And when it's time, let go of them. When it's time, let go of them. I'm going to jump ahead here to our last point. Today's big idea, again, we will experience a deeper joy as we bring joy to others. Mom, your conduct can bring joy to your kids. Just know that. And then finally, number three. First one, adorn yourself authentically. Conduct yourself respectfully. And number three, submit yourself faithfully. Submit yourself faithfully. Look at these verses here, verses five and six. This is kind of where uh, Peter begins to wrap up these thoughts to this woman in this frustrating situation for this is how the holy women who hoped in god used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands you know how they handled that frustration in their and and found joy in their frustration they adorned themselves by submitting to their own husbands like seriously like there's joy in submitting to my husband and he's an unbeliever time out Six, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. And so he, she uses Sarah who called Abraham Lord because she submitted to him. And uh, many people look at that as, oh, just a patriarchal society. But there is something there about the way God wired men and women. And there's joy in that. There's joy in that. And we need to know that. I was thinking about, you know, this week, you know, it's fascinating. We think about this idea. Well, here it is. Here's, here's the, the, the toxic lie that you hear, right? We must fight for our rights. Like, that's the toxic lie. Like, you got to fight for your right. You got to stand up for yourself. Don't let yourself be taken advantage of. That's so anti-gospel. Jesus went to the cross and he didn't fight for his rights, did he? But he did what was righteous. And he made you and me righteous in the process. And we look at today, we look at this issue with abortion today. And so many fight for their rights. Like abortion is a right or wrong issue. Like I have the right to take this, this life. I have the right of my own body. and I have, and, uh, But there is a higher thing than just right. It's right. What's righteous in God's eyes? What's holy in God's eyes? That life is. Saw a great meme this week that really... Just listen to this. When abortion was legalized, we didn't have ultrasounds, meaning we didn't know that the baby in the womb had such early heartbeats, sucked their thumb, and could feel pain. So where are the scientists today? Trust the science, right? Trust the science. Well, hey, and ultrasounds show us that that is a life in the womb. We live in a world today that wants to fight for their rights, and yet we see the exact opposite when you turn to the pages of Scripture. And there is more joy in not fighting for your right, and in submitting to the Word of God. So think about this. Submission is not a dirty word. It's not a demeaning word. It's a godly practice. I'm going to show you some things here about submission in the next just like five minutes as we wrap up that is so powerful to understand submission. And to the world, submission is a dirty word. Like, oh, women submit to their husbands. That's such a patriarchal thing. The Bible is so old-fashioned. It's so demeaning. It's so, no, it's not. 
Now it is true that anything and submission, it can be twisted and it can be abused. And so you need discernment in any, in any relationship that you're not abused in that sense. And it's true that there are those who use the concept of submission as a means of power over another. And that is clearly not what the Bible teaches. In fact, think of it like this. A woman, okay, a woman is supposed to respect her husband, but you should never lose your own respect as you respect your husband. That, that, that would be, yeah, that would be a bad situation. Something's off there. What Peter is talking about here is a woman who shows her respect to her husband and in the process she wins his respect and he eventually comes to know Christ. You know, most men who abuse this idea of submission in a marriage and abuse women at the same time, they don't respect their wives. See, the goal of all this, right? You submit to your husband and you show him respect so that he will what? So he will eventually respect you and come to Christ. So if you're in a relationship where you're submitting and you're respecting that person and, and following this and they don't respect you, then, yeah, then some discernment is there and you're in an abusive situation. This is speaking very generally here. But let me show you the beauty behind the idea of submission, the issue of submission, and the powerful impact it can have on a relationship and the deeper joy that is embodied in it. So Paul talks about this and think about biblical expression having two expressions. Biblical submission has two expressions. Look at it over here in Ephesians 5. Paul writes this. Ephesians 5. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise but as wise. Understand what the will of the Lord is, the Lord's will here. He's going to lay it out for us. Be filled with the Spirit, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father. And number verse 21 there, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. It's God's will that in a marriage relationship that the husband and wife submit to one another. Like, like submission is a two-way street. Like true submission is each person submitting to the, to the other out of reverence for Christ as we ultimately submit to Christ. So watch this. We'll, we'll see this over in Philippians 2 then. We're going to see the two sides of submission. If you read through in Ephesians 5 there, you'll see in Ephesians 5 that what, uh, what Paul talks about then is that the, the wife should submit to her husband and the husband should love his wife like Christ submitted to the church. That's what Paul talks about. So we'll see this in Philippians 2. Look at this. Philippians 2, we're going to end here. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Okay? So that's kind of like, yeah, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. We, it's a mutual submission. Then he goes on. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. And so here Jesus is submitting himself to the Father. Like Jesus Christ is equal to the Father, he's equal to God, but he submitted himself humble, in, in humble submission. And then we go on in verse 7, but emptied himself. By taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And here Jesus then does what? But he, he, he offers himself as a humble sacrifice for you and I. He loves us. And so look at this. We're, we're, when, when we submit mutually in a relationship, we're mirroring Christ. And so for a wife... Her submission is a deep respect for her husband. It's like, I realize that God has wired you to respond to my respect, and I'm going to respect you, and I'm going I'm to ask you, I'm going to want you to lead in our family. I want you to lead us spiritually. I want you to lead us to church and lead us in prayer and lead us into the Bible. And I want you to lead our family in our fine. I just want you to lead us. And we're equal, and we're submitting to each other. But my role is to respect you with a deep respect and I submit to you in that sense. We both have a voice, we're both equal, but I submit to you. And then, the husband, how, does he, how is he mutually submissive in this relationship? A husband's sacrificial love for his wife because God has wired women to respond to what? To being loved. Like they just respond to love and, and being cherished and, and being honored. And, and so, we're to love our wives like Christ loved the church. A husband's sacrificial love and in that process as we both mirror Christ. That's what the, word, what the scriptures, what God really means by this idea of submission. 
And it's a beautiful thing. And when this happens, you know what happens? There's great joy. It's not that the wife doesn't love her husband. Certainly she does. And it's not that the husband never submits to his wife and that and respects his wife. He does. We do all of those things. But God has designed women to respond to love and designed men to respond to respect. And that's what the Bible tells us we should do to have a really, really, really strong relationship. And this will even filter on down to the kids. I have one last verse on here. And just know this, biblical submission leads to joy. And I started here earlier in the service, right? Because in Hebrews, it tells us that Jesus Christ went to the cross. In that frustration of the cross, all the mixed emotions of the cross, he went to the cross. And for the joy that was on the other side, it says, he went to the cross. There was joy as he submitted to the Father. There was joy as he laid down his life as a sacrifice. Because what? It is better to give than to receive. Better to give than to receive again. We will experience a deeper joy as we bring joy to others. Let me leave you with one last verse. Here's verse 7. Then likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel. Since they are heirs with you of the grace of life so that your prayers may not be hindered. So husbands, show honor to your wife. She's the weaker vessel. And we know that's true in a biological sense, but it's the way God has wired them. They're a little more tender. They're a little more sensitive to things. That's the way God wired them to just have feelings that we can be pretty harsh, right? We're pretty tough. So understand them and show honor to them. And children, show honor to your mom as well today. Pick that word out and show honor. That's the last word we could throw on, right? Adorn, conduct. Submit, and then for us, as a response, let's honor our moms. Let's, let's, let's honor our wives. Let's do that. Let me leave you. Again, we'll experience deeper joy as we bring joy to others. Let me leave you with this video. It's Mother's Day, a time to celebrate all the wonderful mothers out there, not just for being shining examples of how great a mom can be, but also for being beautiful reflections of who God is. Like God, you've provided for us. You've shown us how much you care from the very beginning. With God, you've guided us, helping us navigate through every decision, big or small. You've been patient with us, helping us grow and learn from the mistakes we make. And like God, you forgive us, offering us grace so those mistakes can never define us. You've been present. It sounds so simple, but it's so important just knowing you're there when we need you. And most of all, you've loved us unconditionally as only someone filled with God's love could. So today we thank you, moms, for all of this and so much more. Happy Mother's Day. Lord, thank you for today. Lord, I pray you'll bless all the moms today. Um, I pray you'll help them, help us all find joy in the frustration of this world. Um, pray for all the, all the women in here, all the girls in here, the moms, the wives, that they would be able to look in a mirror today and recognize that because they know Christ, because Christ is their life, there's this hidden beauty of their heart. And they need to let people see it. And they don't need to measure up to the superficial standards of this world. They measure up in you, and that's all that matters. They have a gentle and quiet spirit. And yeah, sometimes maybe that gentle and quiet spirit um, doesn't come out, another spirit comes out. That's true for all of us. Just remind us who we are in you. Help us walk in the spirit. 
Remind us to adorn, conduct, submit, and then for us as dads and children to honor our mothers this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay. Say take one and then smack it down. Action! What does your mom talk about a lot? Mostly stuff that I cannot question and I don't know about. Reading. She's trying to get me into reading, I just don't get it. Taxes. She doesn't talk about the stuff she always sings. She always sings about Beyonce. What's something your mom's always telling you? Stop talking about the iPad. No iPad. <laughs> Go brush your teeth. How does she know you didn't brush your teeth? <laughs> she just knows. I can't. You can't remember? Oh. No, man. I can't. Oh, that's okay. Clean my room. Is your room get kind of dirty? Kind of. Kind of? Kind of. Would your mom say it's kind of dirty, or would your mom say, this is dirty? Kind of. Are you getting tired of my questions? Kind of. Kind of? Does she sing, like, worship music? It's only my dad who sings worship music. So your dad sings worship music, and your mom sings Beyonce? Yeah. If your mom was a superhero, what would her superpowers be? Best, so she can just get the laundry done, because we always have so much laundry. So much laundry. Why would she need super speed, you think? So she wouldn't be late anymore. So. <laughs> Making people's ear hurt, because how loud she sings. She'd just go, Wah! and it would just stop the crime. What does she do at work? She looks at people, or? She looks at people? Well. That kind of sounds like Facebook. <laughs> no. Usually it's just messaging. Just messaging, just more, messaging. More, me messaging. more and more messages, messaging. just constantly. So how does your mom know that you love her? I tell, tell her that. Her. You tell her that? Yeah. Do you guys say it at the same time like you just did then? Or no. <laughs> no. Um, I give her hugs. We, we play outside and we ride our scooters and bikes. How do you know that mom loves you? She does kind of stuff. Yeah. For me, she does my hair pretty, and and she always always sings to me. She cooks really good chicken, spaghetti. She gives us hugs. Mom hugs are the best, aren't they? She says, "You know what?" And I say, "You love me." And she's like, "How do you know that?" Cause I, cause you always say it. <laughs> yeah, she always says it cause she loves me. It's kind for me and my brother. She's gone to her whole family. Why is your mom the best mom in the world, do you think? The only reason is because it's my mom. You love her just because she's mom? Mm hmm I love that. Awesome. Do you have any questions about my mom? Nope. Not interested at all in my, about my mom? Nope. Okay. Fair enough. Good job.